chapter start in verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground he made uh, the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the, to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if you will, skip down with me to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Um, let's uh, let's go ahead and read some in uh, chapter 3 verse 1 now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said unto the woman yea if God said he shall not eat of every tree of the garden and the woman said unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God hath said ye shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it lest ye die the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid. Uh, uh, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Ah. Don't worry. I will make do with what I have up here. All right, we see, we see two trees in the garden. God creates all this and makes this wonderful planet and everything. And then he makes this beautiful garden. And in this garden is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So we will put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil here. Um, That's the fruit of this tree. 
And that's the reality of the truth. Now, this is where religion has left life. And that's the other tree. It's the tree of life. Religion has said it's only about good or evil. Which can't possibly be because the roots of this tree are the same for good or evil. Regardless of whatever fruit you bring forth, the roots are basically the same. But religion says there's a tree of bad and there's a tree of good and you should do good. But we don't believe in religion. We believe in Christ. We believe not in a religion, but in a person. And that person, when He came, Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Okay. So, immediately, when we start teaching these things, our minds are confronted with old ideas, old teachings, old concepts, where we try to pull off all of the bad fruit and try to put forward and make in, uh, in full view of everyone the good fruit. So when people look at us, they look at our tree, they say, oh my, you are such a fruitful person, you have such good fruit coming off of you. And they have worked very, very, very hard to get all the evil out of their life. Okay? But the truth is, with all of that work, with all of that effort, you are no different except in your appearance to others outwardly. Huh? Really, the only difference, I mean, there's been no inward change, there's been no root change, there's been no core change. The only change has come outwardly as we throw away our cigarettes and as we throw away our cussing, as we throw away these things and we say, I used to be a bad person, but now I'm a good person. But if that's all that happens to us, then we are no different than we were before, except for now, you know, uh, we look a lot better. And we, uh, you know, I feel a lot better about myself. You know, trust me, the goal of Jesus coming isn't so that you can feel better about yourself. His goal is to bring forth His life within you and me. We are to be trees of life. We are, and there's a scripture that says, you are the God of the Lord's garden. You are the Lord's farm, is another translation. Uh, orchard, how about that one? And it is, it is supposed to be life. These are issues of life. The religion has made them issues of right and wrong, good and evil. And, and where do they get that from? Well, you get that from the Old Covenant because this tree, in that sense, represents the Old Covenant. Because the Old Covenant was that God made a covenant with man and He said, if you do good, I'll bless you. And if you do bad, I'll curse you. And so man tried to do his best to do good and God did that in an effort to show us that we couldn't do good apart from Jesus Christ. I mean, we could do good things, but we in ourselves are not what God wants. And even at our best attempts, we still do not come up with the fruit that is brought forth by life, brought forth by Christ. Nobody can bring forth that kind of fruit except Jesus. Now, that's the good news of the new covenant, is that Christ is in us. And therefore, His life brings forth His fruit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, goodness, temperance, long-suffering, uh, self-control. These, these are the things of the, of the fruit of the Spirit. These are not the fruit of you. This is not you. This is not your way. You sometimes show love, and sometimes you show hate. And sometimes when you know you ought to love, you don't love. And sometimes when you know you ought to forgive, you don't forgive. You just go through the motions over here, and you say, I forgive, only to have that rise back up in your heart, and then you want to strangle that person. Amen? We say, well, I'm trying to forgive. Well, that's it. So you're trying. This is, this is the tree of trying to put on the good fruit. This is the tree of where you've already died, and this is the tree of life. When you die to yourself, and Christ begins to be formed in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Alright, so there's this whole 
religious tenor that people have never left the Old Covenant. And so they're always working on themselves. They're always working to, for self-improvement. They don't realize that God's plan never was for self at all. It was for Christ. That, and so you see that in the garden when God created uh, Adam and Eve is that um, He breathed into them the breath of life. But breathing in them the breath of life only started their engine. He jump-started them. But there was another life because imagine God creating in Adam or breathing in Adam the breath of life and then showing him that there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and there's another tree that he's never eaten of called life also. Called life. So as he's standing there looking, he goes, I thought I had life. And he says, you do have life, but there is another life that you must partake of. And this we see in things like Ezekiel when, when uh, God gave him the scroll which represented the, the Word of God. He gave it to him and he said, eat it. He didn't say read it, he said eat it. As newborn babes did not desire the sincere milk of the Word. See, a newborn babe doesn't go... Tell me about milk. <laughs> Inform me of the ingredients of the milk. The nutritional value. Let me understand the basic thing that milk is going to do for me. A baby doesn't go through any of that. And I'm, I'm, I'm just basically quoting the Scripture in Peter. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, they just say, I'm hungry. I want, I need something inside of my tummy, not inside of my brain. Knowledge, life. Knowledge, no matter what it is, it's knowledge. Uh, I always get a, a picture kind of of that. And uh, one is this picture of somebody like this, and their head's real put forward like this, you know. There's somebody that walks by knowledge, and they walk around like this because they're somebody else walks by their heart, by life. And they walk by that life going forward instead of their head being forward. I just, it's just a picture I've always had of, of people who are pressing forward like this in knowledge and people who are not, not in a proud way, but they're walking after the heart. They're walking after life. And I'll just be honest with you. I don't know a whole lot of people that walk by life as a form of government. I know a whole, I happen to be in the, the realms that I'm in, I happen to know a whole lot of people that know much about the cross, that know much about the teaching, that know much about these things. But they do not walk by life. They walk by knowledge. And their knowledge breaks down in the crisis. Their knowledge, and your knowledge will always break down in the crisis. You say, well, I'm going to spend a, a, a concerted amount of time and I'm going to know some stuff and I'm going to get good and I'm going to, you know, trust me, you can put all that stuff in there and it don't come out if it's just knowledge. Only life comes out because it's Him. It's a person. And you see, the deal is we are related to a person. When I say related, I don't just mean Jesus sits somewhere far away on a throne and you know, and I pray to Him. I'm talking about a relationship of life. A relationship where when you get in situations that are beyond you, you are not fooled by that or discouraged by that because you have a relationship of life where you say, hey, this has nothing to do with me. Now, I was never meant, I was taught in the Old Covenant, I was never meant to really carry this. Christ was meant to carry this. And Lord, I look to You right now. You are the life within me. The life I live in this flesh, I live by the faith that I am crucified and that You are my life. That's Galatians 2.20. It's nothing more than the faith that, that the Apostle Paul lived by, who was the main writer of the New Testament. I mean, talk about a man who had knowledge and yet, He did not present knowledge to us over and over and over. He presented a person. And, he, and, and you know, sometimes in teaching, you're saying all this knowledge, but in reality, 
The Apostle Paul was never trying to make people knowledgeable in the sense that most of us seek knowledge. He was trying to introduce them more deeply, more clearly, to the living Jesus Christ. Not the one on the throne, but the one that we all, if you're born again, you have received life. Amen? Alright, so God puts uh, Adam and Eve in that garden. And in putting them, putting the tree of life there, he is saying that you have life, but there is life beyond you. There it is. It's, you can say life abundant, more abundant life. It is a different kind of life. All right, every one of us have life. Everybody, every every person on the planet that is moving and whatever has life. But not everybody has the life of Christ. Every Christian that's born again has the life of Christ. But not every Christian is walking by the life of Christ. They're walking by the fact that Jesus died for me 2,000 years ago and He's my Savior. They're walking by many facts, but they are not walking by life. Um, something the Lord shared with me. Maybe I'll share it later on. It's a little bit early yet to, to get into too much of that. But So, when He puts Adam and Eve in the garden, He, he puts basically just one thing that He calls the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because man has to be tested. We could, If there was no sin and no problems in this earth, nothing to test us, then we all would say, well, I'm, I'm perfect, I'm good, da 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 But He puts things there to find out where we really live. So we'll find out. I mean, it's like God coming down after Adam and Eve had eaten of the, of the fruit. And He's walking around going, Adam and Eve, where are you? You don't think God knows where they are? He's not, he's not you know, walking around confused like, where are they, man? <laughs> Dude, they were here. Where are they? You know? God knows everything. He knows right where they are. But God's always speaking to us so that we can find out where we are. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> and that's, what, that's His great work is to try to awaken us to where we are. And you know what? He's never trying to awaken us to where we are in the sense of if we're off or we're not where we should be or we're, we failed. Or He's never trying to awaken us simply to failure, but to awaken us to where we are that we might move from there unto Him. Amen. It is always a call, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come, come, come. It's always, <laughs> and it is never in that sense, come away from, except as you come unto. Looking away unto Jesus. Because if you're, if you're looking at something over here and you turn and you look at Jesus, then you've looked away from that. But your motive is not just to look away. Okay, because if, if your motive is just to look away from something and Jesus is over there, okay, I know I need to look at Jesus. You know, I'm looking at Jesus. And uh, I'm not getting looking back over here again. Okay, I'm going to look away from that man. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to look at that anymore. I'm going to look at Jesus. You know? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Where you're wrestling and you keep going back. And you're saying, now, I know what I need to do, but I don't seem to be able to do it. That's because what you are doing is you are you are fighting this thing of knowledge of good and evil, it is good to look to Jesus. It is evil to look to that. And I am re I'm in a wrestling match with myself. But by life, when you begin to look at Jesus, when your motive is to come unto Him, you will look away from Him. You will come away. If you are coming to Him, you'll be going away from whatever that thing is. And that comes as we are drawn unto life. Not a theological teaching. Not, not a good good Jesus that we think will help us. But it is as you come unto Him in life and in resurrection that you will begin to find the power of resurrection in your life. It will be the power of His resurrection. It will be the power of an endless life in you. But that's the only way you're ever going to ultimately overcome. Willpower only works so long. And let me tell you, some people are strong-willed. God will show you that even with your strong will, you don't have enough. You are not adequate. He will arrange your circumstances. You say, well, why is He arranging this, man? 
He's arranging it to bring you unto Him. He's arranging it to say, don't be satisfied with the knowledge of the Lord. Be satisfied with the Lord. And that's the desire that constantly in His heart. Because Jesus knows those that are gathered around Him. Those that are, those that are drawn up unto Him. Those that, that speak often of Him. Those that are His jewels. He knows, he knows who they are. He, but how does He know that? Well, He has beaten up. No, they're with Him. You understand? They are with Him. They are connected with Him. They are interacting with Him regularly. Others are walking on the earth and they think they're interacting because they pray. But prayer is communion. Prayer is not a religious thing where you speak up there, oh God, somewhere. You know? That's not drawing on Him. That's not being close to Him. That's not relating in, in communion with Him. And He knows that. And He knows that better than we know because we say, I'm there, baby. And he says, you haven't ever been there. You've visited the house of the Lord. But you've never come in and dwelt in the house of the Lord. Amen? David said that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Most everybody else wanted to visit. And that's what we do. I'm going to go visit God. Then I'm going to go back. I'm going to go visit God. Then I'm going to go back. I'm going to go visit God. I'm going to go back. You know. No, you get to a place where there's one life, there's one way, there's one mind, there's one body, there's one baptism, there's one Father, there's one Lord, and that, that is, that's your existence. It's not an existence down here, it's an existence in Christ. Not in heaven, in Christ. In the Lord, dwelling in Him, abiding there with one purpose. You are abiding there with the purpose of drawing out that which is Him into your skinny little <laughs> branch so that what you manifest is Him. And being good and doing good things, that's great. Well, that's just wonderful. You know what? Philanthropists do that. And many of them are ungodly. I mean, they don't even believe there's a God. You know, but they give away money and they do all. It's not that. But, but if you do that by Christ, then it is that. But it's not, it's not a thing. There's no thing that you can do. What, what did the rich young ruler say to Jesus? Good master, tell me what I must do to inherit eternal life. What I must do. He's going, you can't do nothing to inherit, you know? It's like, my mom has real blue eyes. Can you imagine me as a little boy going up and saying, Mom, what do I have to do to, to, to get blue eyes like yours? She'd go, well, honey, you, all you have to do is be born in the family. You got them. You know? I got my mom's eyes. All you have to do is be born in the family. All you got to do is be part of this family. All you got to do is have the life that is us in you. And then you inherit isn't that right? Anybody here look kind of like your family? Well, if you don't, don't blame me. I don't know that. <laughs> I'm trying to make a spiritual point, not you know, solve your past problems. <laughs> All right. So he says, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And there is this reality of oneness and of union where that which is, let me just say, abiding in Him is not a truth. It is a fact. Abiding in Him is an active, active relating to the Lord. Abiding in Christ is a, an active relating to the Lord with an active purpose. And that purpose is that what is in the vine will come into the branch, which is me, and then there will be a, if you will, a chemical reaction. Vine life in branch equal fruit. What kind of fruit? His fruit. Not good fruit. God fruit.
It's the result of the life of Christ. It is His fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. It is the fruit of the life of Christ, the fruit of His nature. Coming out of us so that when certain things happen, and in fact it becomes a lifestyle, you begin to go, you know, this isn't me. It is no longer I, but Christ. You know, now I know every once in a while we do something, we go, well, that wasn't me, that's was God. The rest, 95% is me. That was God. You know, and we feel real proud about that. I mean, we would never say that. We, we don't use the percentage stuff. <laughs> but, but I mean, we, you know, I mean, if we go a long time, and then all of a sudden something happens. We go, man, that was God. That was just God right there. Man, I tell you what, God came out of me. You know, well, that's great. You know, I know that you want me to jump up and down with you and do a little jig and dance and make you feel happy that God came out of you five percent of the time. But you picked the wrong man. My desire is that Christ fill your vessel. You know? That when you, you know, if you get that cup of tea or that cup of coffee or whatever it is you like in the morning, you don't go and put a little bit of, you know, on it. You fill it up and you go, ah, yeah. You know, even if you're not going to drink it all, you want it full. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Come on, folks. <laughs> you know? Well, the Lord wants His vessels full. He wants His vessels full of Himself, full of His life, full of the things that proceed out from Him. Ah, so here's, here's Adam and Eve, and they're in the garden, and this says, no, don't eat of that one. And all, because there are more than just two trees. I mean, there are, it says there are a whole bunch of trees. There are all kinds of trees in there. Okay? He says, so he says, don't eat of that one, but you can eat freely of all the other trees. Now he didn't say, now I'm telling you right now, you better run to that tree over there. You better run to the tree of life. You got life, but you don't have the right kind of life yet. And you, no. Why did he not do that? Because he wanted man to discover his need beyond himself. He wanted man to say, you know what, even with good, I'm not happy unless I have God. You know? The Lord makes the difference. The Lord is the thing that makes the difference. And He wanted man to discover a higher form of life. Better than good. Better than, you know, defeating the evil in yourself and coming up with the good. And so, then the devil comes along and the devil says... Did God say that you couldn't eat of every tree? You remember how we, how we read that there? He makes it sound, uh, let's see. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? There's all these trees. There's, who knows, hundreds of different kind of trees. And God says you can't eat of one. And the devil comes along and says, oh, God says you can't eat of every tree? God is restricting your freedoms. God is making you miserable. I mean, there are hundreds of trees that you can eat from, but you, you know. But the devil knows how to word things. He'd make a good attorney. He knows how to put it just so that we'll go, well, yeah, God said I couldn't, I couldn't enjoy everything. God didn't say you can't enjoy everything. He said you can't have that. Alright. So, man goes over here, eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But just before he does it, the devil says, man, you want to eat of that because if you eat of this, you'll be like God. And you'll be wise. And so the woman looked at it and says, well, I want to be wise. Well, I want to be like God. Do you see what happened here? The devil didn't say, you know what, I don't know if you've noticed, but just outside of the Garden of Eden, there's a bar. You could get drunk from it. You know, Adam, there's a house of prostitution just down the way. Nobody in it because Eve's the only woman on the planet. But anyway, there's a house there. <laughs> Whoa, 
I'm trying to make a point here. My point is, is that the great sin that caused the fall of the whole human race wasn't the stuff that we call sin. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. The thing that caused the fall of the whole human race is not the things you're trying to avoid and get out of and stop. The thing that put, if you will, poison in all of mankind had nothing to do with what we call right and sin. It had everything to do with wanting to be like God. Anybody want to be like Christ? Anybody want, want to get close to the Lord? Anybody want some wisdom? So did he. So did he. I'm telling you that the stuff that trips you up, the stuff that trips you up is not what you think is tripping you up. You are stumbling regularly over stuff that is a bigger issue to God and causes more poison than all the bad things that you're trying to avoid in your life. So that's the purpose of this class, folks, is we're trying to divide out. We're going to go through the Scriptures. And we're going to show these examples of, of man that partook of this tree and man that partook of this tree and the results. Now, if God doesn't open your eyes, this is going to be what we call another class. And Lord knows we can do this forever. I mean, you know, how long has this Bible school been going? 13 years? You know, I mean, I can teach another class. I mean, I'm good at teaching classes. But I'm losing interest. I'm losing interest in just teaching classes. You know? But teacher, we're all in our places with bright shining faces. I don't care if you didn't put makeup on. I wouldn't I'd be shiny nose. What I care about is are your hearts open not to me, but to the Holy Spirit and what He wants to communicate. And I'm also going to tell you this. There's a whole bunch of people in this room that really don't think that they need to listen to what I'm saying because they really believe that they understand this already. And they don't. So, there. Uh, Alright. What if this was nothing more than deep knowledge of what is good and what is wonderful as opposed to watch out for this or that? You could, you know what? You could get into discerning between good fruit and bad fruit. Now there's a scripture that talks about discerning, but it doesn't say discerning between good and evil. It says discerning both good and evil. That's, there's both of them right there. You check it out. It's in your Bible. But see, if you misread your Bible, then you may misread the whole plan of God. So can anybody see a reason why we need to cry out to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I don't want to listen to man. I don't want to listen to Randy. I don't want to listen to TV evangelists. I don't want to listen to, 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 to some guy in a big church with a big steeple. I want to learn the Word from you. Holy Spirit, please. And, and everything within you saying, I am not satisfied with my understanding of the Lord. I want you. I want to go deep. I want to know you by life. Because this right here, you can just, you know, that scripture, ever learning. Well, that doesn't apply over here to life. Because there can be an increase of life without a real increase of understanding in your head. I'm talking about in your head. You know. It's not about everybody becoming brainy. You know, I remember I worked at Denton State School many, many years ago. And there was I, I was sharing with some of the, the kids, you know. And they're mentally retarded children. And so this one person said, well, you know what, they they can't 
get saved. They don't understand. They don't understand when you share with them about Jesus. I thought, how stupid. You know, I led several of them to the Lord. And they changed. You can see the difference. But they thought you have to understand everything in your head. And I'm saying you have to have a reception in your heart for Jesus. You know? So this is not about who's the smartest, who's the wisest. You can be a very smart person and be dumb in God's eyes. Huh? But you can be somebody that doesn't grasp this or that or whatever. And I don't, I, you know, has anybody ever said, well, I don't get it? <laughs> you know, you said something, I, I don't get that. Well, that may be the best thing you've got going for you. Because if you think you understand it all, then you're probably sitting there going, yes, amen, amen, that Randy, he's right on, and therefore I'm right on. You see how that could automatically come there? But if you don't understand something, you just might go, you know, I am not happy with this. He keeps saying stuff I don't understand, and I need to get hold of it. Lord, open my eyes. And I mean do that in a in a passionate way. Like a bride. Not like a Pharisee. Yes. Oh God it talks about Jesus talks about standing on the corner praying. Oh God. Oh we thank thee for thy omnipotence. What? You know, and yet I'm thinking that. We've got something because we know all the terminology. Let me tell you something. You can know all the terminology and fail in life. You can regularly face things, come out with something other than Jesus. You and if you and if nobody ever knew it, you can be so well. You know what? Uh, we recently had a wedding here. There were some people that got drunk. And I tell you what, there's some people that drank and drank and drank. And you couldn't tell they were drunk. Am I right or wrong? It's possible to learn to what we call hold your liquor. Instead of walking around, hey, man, this is a great wedding. <laughs> you know, you walk up and go, well, that was a great wedding. This is a great time. You're going I guess they didn't have anything to drink. Oh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. Yeah, when they die, man, you, they're already pickled. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Appearances are deceiving. And some in this place have learned to put on appearances. Would you be willing for us to just pray that God will just strip down our appearances? Now you know if I pray. <laughs> well, I'm not going to pray that. Right now. I'm not. I, I don't. I don't feel it's the Lord at this moment to pray that. I, it is the Lord to pray that, but I don't feel it's the Lord right now at this moment to pray that. Some of you are going, <laughs> My goal is to follow the Lord. It is not to, you know, life should di dictate. Not, you know what? It would seem right. You should have done that. My God, Randy, I hate you forever because that was the time to do it. You didn't do it because it's the right thing. See, that's the knowledge of good. So you've got it all figured out. But you see, I would rather stand before the Lord knowing that my life was dictated by His Son. And so in all things, I want Him to have the preeminence. Not just, not just in, in a general religious way, but in all things to carefully not move. Not, you know, who was I talking to? I was talking to my own sister at the wedding. I said, you know what? I've... I sit in counseling with people and people tell me their problems and tell me all this stuff. And I said, sometimes I sit there and I go, Lord, how in the heck am I going to help these people? My God, I don't have a clue. This is incredible. <laughs> you know? And 
instead of sitting there going, ah, yes, tell me, my child, I know everything. <laughs> I, I don't hardly know anything, but I know Jesus. And I really do know Jesus. I really, 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 I know the real Jesus. I do. I know I do. And if others don't think I do, I don't go, oh my God, they said I don't. <laughs> oh no. I know him. You say what you want. You know. I mean, I'm, I am on a rock. I don't know about you, but I'm on a rock. That doesn't mean everything outwardly happens perfectly. It doesn't mean I do everything right. But I tell you what, I'm on a rock. It cannot be moved. When this earth shakes, that rock is still just as solid as it always was. So, when I'm sitting there going, my God, I have no clue what to do here. I, my next step is, Lord, you know everything. You care about these people. You know whether they need to be patted on the back or rebuked. You know if I need to hug them up or if I need to say, listen here now. You need to, you need to sit up and take some notes here. But, how, you know, well, I would lean toward being more sweet because it's my nature. I'm a much more sweet person than many of you. <laughs> And I think by nature, I am maybe a lot sweeter than a lot of you. The Lord has made me firm. Did you know that? The Lord has made me firm. If, if you need a spanking, I'll do it. That word is, we don't really spank well. <laughs> but spiritually, that's like a mean battle. <laughs> But my point is, my point is, your Heavenly Father loves you. He cares about you. And He knows exactly what you need, when you need it. And I don't. So what hope do I have? I listen to Him. I don't assume by the knowledge of good, well, I know, I know the right thing to do in this situation. Most of the time, when I first pop out with something, well, I know what to do, I stop and I say, you know what? I need to sit on this and pray over this for at least a couple of days. Did you know that I do that? When I Sometimes I know absolutely what the answer is going to be. When somebody comes and says, well, would you have this? I've had two people, three people within the last 24 hours come to me and say, would you pray about so and so? In some cases, I already knew what the answer was. But... I always back off and say, you know what? I need to spend some time with the Lord because I need to make sure that I'm hearing from God. You don't want me coming up with what's in my little brain. I've already seen the fruit of that. What you need is Jesus. What you need is the life of the Lord. What you need is Him. And that's my job. But you know what? See, now you look at me and you say, that's your job because you're the pastor. Now why is it more my job as a pastor that Christ come out of me than your job as a sheep that Christ come out of you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Why? Why isn't that equal? It's just differences of responsibility, but equality of nature. Does that make sense? You know, I mean, Christ should come out of all of us if we receive life, and we have received life. He should come out of all of us. And so, we can learn all these deep things. We can, you know, say, oh man, I can, you know, we can start writing subjects on the board. Oh, I can, I can, I can comment on that in a big way. Oh, I can comment on that in a big way. Oh, I can comment on that. Oh, 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 oh. But what about the practical life of Christ? What about the practical life of Christ? What about when I get in that situation, do I, though I think, because see, I can, I can rename the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did you know that? I can redefine everything in my life. And I can rename these things, this is not good anymore, it's Christ, and this is evil. So if something is good to me, it's Christ. And if something is bad, then it's the devil. Okay? 
Well, hang Jesus on the cross. That's bad. This must be the devil. No, that was the Lord. That was God. That's God dying for your sin so that you might live. Daniel thrown in the lion's den. Oh, this is bad. No, this is good. This is God getting more honor than He would have gotten in any other situation. Three Hebrew children thrown in the fiery furnace. This is bad. No, this is not bad. See, you'll not find the answers to any of that on this tree. Unless you start redefining the truth. Then, you're more worse off than you could ever imagine. Because now, the thing that you think is Christ is not Christ at all. It is your perception of what you think is right or good. And you're calling it Christ. Christ is a person. He's a life. He is a spirit and a nature and a way of perceiving. And when all this junk comes out of us, and when our basic mindset rolls, well, what about this? How come this? And I don't understand that. Why is this got and none of that? We're all we're just and you know we're just we're just going through all sorts of stuff all the time. We have not come to the person who is peace. We have not come to the person who is love. We may have heard the subject of love, and we may have heard the subject of peace and rest, but we have not come to the person of it. The person of it shows up in us. Huh? And so that's beginning to possess the land. That's beginning to possess Christ. No amount of learning or knowledge does that. Only by, in other words, you get in a situation and say, okay, I'm in Bible school. I'm going to spend the next three years learning the stuff so that when it's over, I can sit with the elders of the land. You know, meaning I, I can hang out with the big shots. I can run with the big dogs. You know. Or you say, I'm going to spend three years here Everything that comes up in my life that is contrary to Jesus, I'm going to attack that with the Word of God and with the reality of the cross. And I want life. I want life. I want this life that overcomes. Not I want to know a bunch of stuff and deceive myself. Hello. Thought pattern. Strongholds. You know what? The stronghold of Zion was easily taken by David. Oh, yes. The strongholds that are in you are easily taken by the Lord. You say, you say like all those before David. We have taken every part of the land. We have taken the giants. We have taken this. But we cannot take this stronghold. This stronghold is too strong for me. I don't know, man. We've used every method. We've come up with everything. I've been to every preacher. Everybody's laid hands on me. I've heard every prophecy and I'm still the same. Well, have you heard this message called Christ and Him crucified? Have you heard of this reality of the resurrection Himself? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Okay. Now wait a minute. Wait a minute, Jesus. Wait, wait, wait. You know, I mean, I, I imagine being Peter, one of the guys there. Okay, look, I know how this story's going to end. Here in a couple of years, you're going to die on a cross. Then you'll be the resurrection. You're speaking a little too early here. You haven't even been crucified yet, so how can you say you're the resurrection and the life? You're, you're, you're jumping the gun here. No, you're jumping the gun. You're living in time and space and trying to figure it all out, trying to apply it, and I'm just life. Always have been, always will be. First and the last. Beginning and the end. Alpha and Omega. Woo. That's who He is. At all times, always will be. I am. Not I. I'm going to be resurrected. Really? Well, I hope I will too. And when you get resurrected, will you remember me? Jesus said, look, I am the resurrection. I am right now. Oh, amen, amen. I'm glad to hear this message. Yes, yes, glory. Jesus, you are the resurrection. And I will change my terminology from now on. No! Are you walking in newness of life? 
Is the resurrection overcoming you now? Your thoughts, your ways, your things. Are you actively seeking Jesus by life? Or are you seeking knowledge of Jesus? Hello? Alright. I'll share this last thing and then we'll close with this section. The revelation of Christ, which we speak of a lot around here, the revelation of Christ is not a message, but a lifestyle. Amen. The revelation of Christ is not a message. It's a lifestyle. When Christ is revealed, the way that you are changes because His Spirit and nature and way begins to flow through you. The hope of change is not that Jesus changes you. The hope of change is that Jesus is the change within you. Now, we all know that. But let me say again, the revelation of Christ is not a message, but it is a lifestyle. So that as God unveils His Son, you're not seeing stuff. That's not revelation. That might be inspiration. That might be illumination. But revelation is when you see Him, you fall down as dead and then He raises, raises you up and says, I am the resurrection. That happened in the Word of God, by the way. You really see Him, you go, all life goes out of you, you're down. That's revelation. I, I just saw the only life that really is anymore, the tree of life, and I'm just supposed to be a branch on that. And then the, the tree touches the branch and his life comes into it and everything changes. And, and before that, he said, this is John, we're speaking of. Well, I was a, I'm an apostle. I'm one of the twelve. One of the frozen cho chosen. And huh? He'd been an apostle. He'd been a follower. But when he saw Jesus, folks, it was no more John. The Alpha and the Omega began to be manifest through him. And what began to happen is he began to eat this message. And now I'm going to give you in a nutshell here. Uh, book of Revelation, Book of Ezekiel, Book of you know, Bible. There's this process where you begin to enter in, you see Jesus, He begins to fill you, then He begins to outflow out of you, and then others are touched, and pretty soon uh, people begin to know Him, and then a temple begins to be formed up, and then that Lamb Spirit and nature is enthroned in the midst of those who have eaten of this and become one, and then out from them flows a river that goes to, for the healing of the nations. Ezekiel, Revelation, New Testament from Genesis to Revelation. Basic process, but it begins, and you don't jump into the big middle of this thing. It begins with the revelation of Christ. And the revelation of Christ is not the day that you see great things. The day the revelation of Christ happens is the day the veil is rent and He floods your compartment. And you, and you know, somebody says, how will I know when I come to a revelation of Christ? Well, you know, it'll sneak up on you. <laughs> no. You know, you'll know the difference between knowledge and life. It'll be easy. You'll know. You, you, it'll be like John. when you. It'll be like the, the Queen of Sheba who came, heard all these stories about Solomon, and came and looked at Solomon and looked at his courts, looked at the temple, looked at the order of his servants, the very same thing I was telling you, it works down into the temple, then it begins to flow out, touch her. She loses all spirit in herself, and she has no more questions, no more, you know. See, that's one way that you can find out. You have no more questions. You say, well, how can that be? Because you found the answer. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you know, I got this problem with my, you know, my runny nose. It's not those kind of questions. All you you will forever be seeking to know Him as the answer. 
but you will look no other place for he will be the answer to you. You understand what I mean? You will be satisfied. So you won't be looking anywhere else. So the revelation of Christ is, is a devastatingly wonderful thing. <laughs> because all that we were created for begins to be fulfilled in us. And all the things that we so desired and sought diligently through knowledge, through effort, that we find